Hello and welcome to Made Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Miriam Cates, Conservative MP for Peniston and Stocksbridge. We spoke about uh, a whole list of things that Miriam is, has been interested in in her four years in Parliament. Uh, surrogacy, transgenderism, assisted dying, pronatalism, um, reproductive technologies in general, childcare, the devaluation of motherhood um and in the extended version of the episode we also spoke about how miriam finds being a christian in westminster and the responses that she gets and also the gap between what uh the public think about many issues including very controversial issues like capital punishment and immigration and what parliamentarians tend to think and whether that gap is a problem that extended version of the episode is available at louiseperry.substack.com where you can also find the mmm chat community the bonus episodes i do with my husband and the whole back catalogue of extended episodes enjoy Many of you will know that Christianity is a subject of fascination for me and the role of Christianity in shaping the modern world is a theme I return to again and again on the podcast. My view is that we really can't understand the world or ourselves without getting to grips with it, which is why I'm very glad to point you towards a new online course called 321. It's an introduction to Christianity that's imaginative, thoughtful, engaging. It assumes absolutely no prior knowledge. It's presented by the wonderful Glenn Scrivener, who has been a guest on the MMM podcast previously and I've also been a guest on his show. Glenn presents eight video-led sessions which are based around some beautiful animated stories that illustrate the Christian message. You can check it out for free at 321course.com forward slash MMM. Just enter your email, choose a password and you're in. There's no spam, there's no fees, just visit 321course.com forward slash MMM. And now onto the show. Miriam, you're one of the MPs who I think has been most outspoken, um, certainly in recent years, on transgenderism and on the impact on children in particular. And um, I think I'm sure some uh, viewers and listeners in the UK will recall the time that you gave a speech. Maybe this was last year that you gave a speech in Parliament about this and a Labour MP completely lost his temper. Yes. In a really, really, a really, uh, in an alarming way, and then came and like sat right next to you on the opposite mm. benches and all this kind of, you know. Would you say that, no, sorry, a more open question. Of all of the issues <laughs> that you talk about as an MP, where does this rank in terms of the sort of heat associated with it? Well, actually, not that near the top, I have <laughs> to say. I think that the people who've gone before me on this issue have certainly faced an enormous amount of abuse and opprobrium. And certainly women on the left, mm. J.K. Rowling or Rosie Duffield, continue to face that kind of hostility. But I think, it's not that I haven't faced any hostility, but I do think that the debate has moved to the point where certainly conservatives are expected uh, to believe that biological sex is real, shall we say. And so although you know, it's still not an easy topic to talk about. It's an awful lot easier to talk about than things like um, motherhood or um, birth rates or, or things like that that are more to do with women, let's face it, than, than men, which a lot of the transgender debate is about men. Um, so, yes, it's not easy to talk about. And certainly, um, you know, the more you become immersed in it, the more you read about it, the easier it is to be able to speak about it without always triggering people. Uh, and it is controversial, but it's not as controversial as some of the is other issues. That's really interesting. So I, uh, maybe the reason that it seems as if you get more heat for the trans stuff is because you do also get a lot of support. So I remember when you, you, you know were met with that kind of bad behaviour in Parliament, there were lots of gender critical feminists and lots of people, you know, like mainstream kind of centre left people who were saying this is terrible, we shouldn't, you know, no MP should be treated like this by her colleagues. Whereas do, when you get pushback for other issues, maybe no one comes to the rescue. So it seems as if it's a less, less of a news story. Yes, yeah, so that was about a year ago. And it was a debate in which we were discussing whether the UK government should effectively stop the Scottish government from legislating for self-ID. Um, and so it was quite a good opportunity to air a lot of these um, ideas in Parliament. 
but you know what was interesting is that my speech you know obviously in my opinion but from other people as well was was fairly moderate and was focused on uh, what this would mean for sa- from a safeguarding point of view for women and girls and I used the example of a, a personal experience where I was in a, a toilet in a restaurant and a man dressed as a woman came in and how that made me feel. And I wasn't implying, and I was clear that I was not implying that he meant me any harm. I was trying to illustrate the point that women have a natural instinct to be suspicious of men they don't know, particularly in enclosed and private spaces. And actually, that's a very helpful, evolved instinct. It's not a judgment on any man. It's just an important protective instinct. And of course, that very much triggered uh, some on the Labour ventures, including the MP you mentioned. And and although it wasn't exactly a nice experience from my point of view, it did brilliantly illustrate what this debate is all about, which is really women and and, and children demanding to be kept safe. uh, And some men, obviously not all, a small minority of men getting very angry about not being able to get what they want. So although it was unpleasant for me, I think it was very, very helpful uh, to illustrate what the debate was about. And of course, in the same week, we had uh, the news about the rapist, Isla Bryson, who's actually a man, being put in a, a woman's prison. Um, and I think in the same period of time, the photo of that enormous male American swimmer winning a female uh, swimming race. So those kind of pictorial illustrations that perfectly illustrate the difference between the thought experiment of gender ideology and the reality of biological sex, I think are very helpful in moving that debate on. Where some of the other issues that I'm sure we'll get on to talk about, uh, natalism, surrogacy, perhaps we're not quite in that space yet where people can see the clash between reality and, and the kind of thought experiment that's gone on. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's a massive factor in why trans has been such a big deal. Because what people say sometimes is like, this is so overblown. We're talking about a tiny number of people, you know. Yes, it's terrible to have a rapist in a woman's prison, but it's still very rare. You know, the the one criticism is that it's the response is really disproportionate. And from one angle, that's true. But then I think the reason why it's become such a flashpoint is because it's the most outrageous example of kind of, I don't normally like using this word because it's been so overused and it used to have a real meaning within domestic violence support services. But it is it is gaslighting mm. in the sense of telling, it's like t- telling people, insisting that water isn't wet at like a societal level and saying, if you don't agree with us that water isn't wet, you will lose your job. You will get, you know, like in extremists, you will have the police knocking on your door, all this kind of stuff. And I think that so many people, including people, some people on the left, have seen that as very alarming. And that's why it's been the kind of leading issue. Whereas, yes, as you say, something like natalism, it doesn't have the same absurdism, I guess. Yes. And and essentially it is the trans debate is a debate about truth. Yeah. Of course, you know, some of these controversial issues, we rightly dance around them a little bit. We don't want to be too direct, too offensive. But, you know, the difference between men and women is the most basic difference that you can think about from a biological point of view. Um, and the very, you know, the very roots of it, you can't gloss over those differences. And so asking people essentially to lie, to say that a man can be a woman, to call a man a woman, to look the other way when someone demands to be a woman, is, it is basically a requirement of citizens not to tell the truth. And I think that is where it's really hit home for people, that this almost uh, policing of thought, compelled speech, it might seem, you know, some people pretend that it's just a culture war, but there's something much more fundamental about it than that. And, you know, it is cultural. If we expect people not to be able to tell the truth or tell them that they can't tell the truth, they might offend people, then that will have repercussions across all of society, surely. Once you've admitted that you can't tell the truth, where does, where does it end? Yeah, absolutely. And it really undermines trust in government. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's one problem with it. Like, if you, if you have official bodies telling people to repeat things which seem so obviously to be lies, how can you then... Yeah. ask people to believe you about any number of other things you know you should take the covid vaccine what just one exactly. example you know if you're exactly. asking people to put their faith in in government decision making then government ought mm. to be very much above basic i mean it's really it, i think overwhelmingly and i'm thinking of um you know uh, it's it's definitely true that there is uh, uh, some men who take this the opportunity with this debate to be to you know, shout at their female colleagues, for instance, or to be very um, 
sort of intimidating and macho about it. It's also the case that probably the majority of people who in public life who are very pro-trans are actually women, like cis women. And I think overwhelmingly what they think they're doing is they think they're being nice. And they probably sort of know that it's not true or not completely true or, you know, but it's the the priority. It's more important to be to be nice than to be truthful. You can see if you're, you know, a kindergarten teacher and you're <laughs> telling a child their drawing is nice, yeah. you can see why that would be a good <laughs> yes. instinct. Yes. But when you're in government. <laughs> yeah, it's unsafe. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. And part of the problem is we have embedded some of these things in our law mm. through the Gender Recognition Act, for example, and the Equality Act. And you know those pieces of legislation, I have no doubt, were well meant. But essentially, the law has to be based on, on fact. Um, otherwise, it, it in itself will change culture. Because the law, the law is a teacher, isn't it? The law represents what we think society should approve of. You know, it's illegal to steal a car um, because society says stealing a car is a bad thing to do. And the problem is that the, the minute you legislate to say a man can become a woman, which essentially is what the Gender Recognition Act does, it throws people into all sorts of confusion because uh, the law itself is then becoming a um, an instrument to change culture rather than just a reflection of reality and what society accepts are, are appropriate boundaries. And that's what exactly what the Equality Act has done. But of course, this has happened across the West. It's not just in this country. We've seen legislation across the world that has thrown into doubt these very basic boundaries that for centuries society um, has accepted are true. And that's it's quite a dif- difficult to fight against that when it's actually embedded in law. It's gone beyond just culture and ideas and you know at some point in time I think we will have to look at repealing the Gender Recognition Act but I don't think the uh, Overton window has has reached that yet. Or indeed the Equality Act yeah I mean yeah one of the things that's happened in one of the things the Conservative government has achieved in 14 years in government is generally um, status on some of these questions so having been pushed very hard by uh, progressive campaigners and by institutions that have been captured by campaigners the government has effectively like not given them what they wanted I mean obviously yes. on the trans thing that was that was not without a big battle um, yeah. but you know the campaigners didn't win and I think that this is something that people who you know you'll know of course a lot of people on the right in Britain are very frustrated with the conservative government I think that it's something that people underestimate though about how bad Labour could be in terms of Rush, you know, the, currently we've had this, the government kind of damming this flow. And I think that that could all disappear and we could see enormous, enormous changes and some really bad legislation. Yeah. Yes, I completely agree. And of course, the common criticism of people when I, when any of us speak up about these issues is, well, you've been in power for 14 years. Why haven't you sorted it out? And, you know, that, that's a fair criticism. And certainly the government could have done more. But if you look at what's happened across the Western world, in every, especially every uh, English speaking country, these trends are, are international. You look at what's happened in Canada and America and Australia uh, under governments of all different p- political persuasions, because the culture that has, ha- has, has swept through these issues is above politics. It's certainly above the influence that individual politicians and even governments have. And a lot of that, I think, is to do with social media, which has been this phenomenal force that the the world has ever seen before and we're only just now starting to recognize um the influence of social media but yeah i don't think i mean what government could have stood up against those forces i don't think there is one and i think the conservative government has probably as you say resisted and held the line more than um a labor government would um and i suppose all that you know, well, the polls seem clear that Labour are going to come to power. And I suppose that all that people like me and my colleagues can do is try to continue to make the case, shift the public debate. And we, you know, the public debate has shifted on the, the trans issue. I mean, just two years ago, very few mainstream papers would print gender critical writers. Uh, and indeed, there's some high profile cases of people leaving The Guardian, for example, because of, of, of that attitude. And yet in two years, with a combination of high profile uh, left wing women like J.K. Rowling and Rosie Duffield, and then the government, the conservative government kind of coming around to this point of view, we have definitely shifted the debate in Britain and actually rode back. If you look at Scotland, if you look at Liz Truss deciding not to go down gender self-ID in England. 
Um, so I am more hopeful on the trans issue for a Labour government than I would have been a year ago. But there are a lot of other issues where I think, yeah, people will people have underestimated how much the Conservative government has actually held the line on these these issues. Okay, what's an example? <laughs> what are you really worried about that Labour might do in one of the issues that you're really uh, invested in? Well, I think assisted dying. I think um, Keir Starmer has said recently that he would allow a vote on that. Um, surrogacy, potentially. The Law Commission have set out some recommendations that would uh, liberalise surrogacy rules in the UK, essentially give surrogate mothers fewer rights. Conversion therapy, that's a very live issue. Um, again, the Labour Party are fairly committed to a ban on conversion therapy. And, you know, like all these issues, on first encountering them, you think, well, well, of course. I mean, what a dreadful thing to try and change someone's sexuality. What a dreadful thing to stop someone wanting to become a parent. Uh, what a dreadful thing to try and stop someone who's suffering intolerably from dying. And, of course, th- those are the, the, the uh, initial arguments that, of course, these campaigns rely on. But like all these issues, when you really dig down into what it means for human freedom, for the protection of the vulnerable, for this kind of change on a societal level that would happen if these uh, legislative changes happen, they are scary. And assisted dying, for, for one example, if you look at any country in the world that's done it, and there are quite a few examples now, it always starts off. Uh, with campaigners saying we want really strong safeguards. This is only for the very, very terminally ill. But in every single time, uh, gradually more and more people are added onto the list of, of who can use this service, if you like. In some countries, children have been included. In mm-hmm. some countries, it now accounts for 4% of deaths. And of course, the societal change that is embedded once you say actually it is okay for somebody's life not to be worth anything anymore. I mean, that's a huge psychological shift for any country um, to take. And of course, once the law has accepted that it's a good thing sometimes for somebody to die, um, then, you know, where does that stop? And I think those are the kind of things I, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I think a free vote under a Labour government, particularly a Labour government with a large majority, I think there's no question that it, that it would pass unless there's some very serious and very good, effective campaigning uh, from now until an election or until the legislation was brought forward. Yeah, one of the things that's troubling about assisted dying being legalised in this country is because we have socialised healthcare yes. and also because we have um, a large welfare state and state pension and so on. It's not in the interest of the state, actually, to keep, say, frail elderly people alive or people or disabled people. Yeah. You know, you just purely in financial interests, it's not in the state's interests. Absolutely. And so if it suddenly becomes possible to legally, you know, remove those people from the books, basically, in terms of the financial burden, it's going to be hard, I think, for even the best intentioned. You know, this is the nature of systems, like the people within the system might all be very well intentioned, but if this is what the law funnels people towards, and that that's likely to end up happening. Although the joke I saw on Twitter recently, is a dark joke, but it did make me laugh, is you'll be told on the NHS that you have six months to live because you have a terminal yes. diagnosis. Um, and But we can add you to the waiting list for assisted dying, which is 12 months. You know, like, <laughs> it may- yes, well, that, that kind of sums up the state of our healthcare system. I <laughs> yeah, think there is a more nuanced debate behind this. I mean, I, I said I'm utterly opposed to uh, legalising assisted suicide because I think it, it, it as I said before, the law is a teacher. Once the law says it's good, beneficial, acceptable to end someone else's life, then that's a, a, a huge cultural change that will only go, you know, there is a slippery slope from that moment onwards. And there's another number of other legislative changes that we can uh, point to that prove that. But I do think there is a more nuanced debate because we, we do now, in the way that we didn't 50 years ago, offer a huge amount of um, treatments to people, even in their 80s and 90s, that prolong life perhaps beyond what is um, comfortable for people. And I think there is a conversation to be had about how doctors um, work with patients who get into their 80s and 90s. Is it sensible to treat someone for cancer in their 80s and 90s? You know, I think these are the kind of, we should be talking about those things very sensitively, of course, but that is an entirely different thing from saying that it's OK for uh, someone to uh, end their own life um, for, for a various uh, reasons. So, um, yeah, I think we need a more nuanced debate. And the problem with debate at the moment, particularly because of social media, is it's very hard to have a nuanced debate. It's all headlines. It's all short sentences. Um, and I, I don't know what the answer is to that. 
there's a deeper sort of theological clash as well, isn't there? Because all the things that you mentioned there, so conversion therapy and assisted dying and uh, surrogacy, and also, there, I mean, there are other things we could add to that list, all sort of campaigning priorities for um, many on the left, including the Labour Party. They are all things which are opposed by Christians. Mm. Like that's a uniting feature of them. Yeah. And I, I think that the guiding sort of theological principle or philosophical principle of those who would endorse, say, assisted dying and um, transgenderism and the, and the rest and surrogacy is it's about maximizing individual freedom. It's about maximizing choice. And so they would say, for instance, that, you know, having it be a standard that someone in their 90s is given lots and lots of medical intervention, even medical intervention that causes further suffering and delays you know delays life at a great cost that's different from that's that's fine because what you want is to maximize the person's ability to choose exactly the moment and the method with which they die so it all comes down to freedom in the end whereas you know you as a christian and many people as christians would say i suppose well uh, yeah what is the <laughs> what's the clash yeah yes, I, what's, I think I think the clash is between rights and value. Mm -hmm. And the the rights-based system, uh, as you uh, you know, as you put so eloquently, is trying to maximize somebody's freedom because, you know, what are my rights? What am I entitled to? What should I be able to choose? And of course, a functioning society needs legally enforceable rights, property rights, rights to a fair trial, absolutely. But our whole philosophical system is now based on, on, on rights. And the problem is when you reach the nth degree, you start to get these clashes. You know, my rights to change gender versus your rights to be able to tell the truth, you know. And obviously the, the abortion debate, all these debates are absolutely based on rights. Whereas I think a Christian worldview is about value, that every individual life is valued infinitely by God, created uniquely by God. And the Bible talks about how God knows how many hairs there are on our head that we were, uh, you know, fearfully and wonderfully made. And our value, Christians believe that our value as human beings is not dependent on whether our lives are wanted or approved of or other, by other people, or if even we want our own lives. The value is completely independently determined, if you like, by the fact that we were made by God, whether we like it or believe it or not. And I think that completely changes how you see these debates. So, um, you know, the abortion debate or, or the surrogacy debate, let's say, um, of course, you know, as a Christian, I feel enormous compassion for people who want to become parents but can't. You know, I've been incredibly fortunate. I have three children. Uh, you know, I have three healthy and straightforward pregnancies. You know, I'm, I'm so blessed in that sense. And what right have I got to say to someone else? You know, you, you can't become a parent or whatever. Of course I don't. I feel huge compassion for people in that situation. But also as a Christian, I believe that, you know, the baby that is brought into the world through whatever means, natural or IVF or whatever, also is infinitely valuable, um, regardless of whether it's wanted or what intention it's been brought into the world for. And so, that I suppose I see this through the value of it, the sacred value of every individual human being, rather than a clash of rights. And I do think that is a different way of looking at it. And of course, it is the the value system that I, our society was created, was um, established under. I mean, we've departed from that, sure, in the last hundred years. But the idea of of that every individual is made in the image of God and therefore has unique value, um, and therefore even if someone wants to end their own life, the rest of the society still values that life. That's what we've departed from and replaced it with this system of individual rights. And I think that we are starting to test that system to its breaking point now with the debates about trans and surrogacy. Because at the end of the day, if you have two sets of competing rights that completely clash, who can be the arbiter? over who wins. It's, it's impossible. It, it doesn't answer its own question unless you have a, a, an objective view of the value of, of each life. My instinct as well is to think that the maternal relationship is sacred and that what surrogacy does inherently, even altruistic surrogacy, is it breaks that maternal relationship. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's sort of a natural law argument, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, um, but it's one that um, it's people can sometimes find really puzzling <laughs> people yeah. on the because it's quite an intuitive thing I think it is yes and I don't think we trust our instincts enough anymore and there's so much that nature and the natural order has to teach us because 
as modern and as technologically advanced as our lives are and the huge benefits that modernization and industrialization and technology bring us, of course they do, essentially our bodies and our brains are exactly the same as they were 100,000 years ago. What makes us happy, what makes us sad, what makes us fulfilled, what makes us frightened, um, they're all exactly the same biological instincts as we had 100,000 years ago. And I think there's sometimes a te temptation uh, amongst liberals particularly to think that we've kind of outrun our nature um, and that, you know, modernization and liberalization means that our nature has changed. It hasn't. You know, human nature has not changed. And I think that that's the strongest argument against surrogacy for motherhood is that actually these things, whether we like it or not, whether we think they should or not, these things do fulfill us still. We do still want children. We do still want to reproduce. It is still a natural instinct, as natural as eating, whether we like it or not. And I think you know, if we look at some of the other debates, like um, people who want to eat less processed food or environmentalists, that's all about returning to nature and returning to the natural way of doing things. Um, and yet somehow when we talk about parenting and motherhood and reproduction, uh, we haven't kind of grasped that yet, that actually sometimes the natural ways are the best, the natural ways are the most fulfilling. Yes, yeah, so on the childcare question, yeah, that's, I mean, that's another one that, um, that that you've been very involved with. The the push generally from, well, from both sides of the house, but I mean, really the, really the mainstream position, right, in politics is that it's good for the economy and it's good for feminism to get women back into work and children into pay childcare ASAP and that seems to be just a given in in most meeting rooms right yes, in yeah. Westminster and that's not generally what the public think mm. and it's also actually a very radical thing to to claim even looking at recent history it wasn't that long ago it was really like the 1990s that you saw a big influx of women with preschoolers into the workforce this is this is very novel. It is. And I just think that ordinary women are ordinary families are so underrepresented in Westminster and the media that it's really hard um, to, to make this argument. And I do think it, a lot of it stems from the fact that you do need two incomes now um, to live even close to living comfortably, really. Partly a lot, a lot of that is to do with house prices. And so there is this dilemma because, of course, yes, you do. Both partners do need to work. That is an absolute given unless we significantly reform the tax and benefit system to make family life more affordable, which, of course, I'm in favour of. But it is the truth right now that for most households, both parents need to work. So then the question is, well, what do you do with the children in those first three to five years when they do need um, constant adult care and before they start school? And the obvious answer for the government and economists to reach to is childcare because, you know, generally people who work in childcare are paid very little and therefore uh, the parents who go out to work earn enough to cover the costs either through taxation or directly of the salaries of the childcare workers. So it looks like an economic good, although I don't actually think the figures add up. But again, with a, as with a lot of these debates, the needs of the children are almost being forgotten here because I do think there is some good evidence that certainly some institutional childcare or out of the home childcare for three to five year olds can be very beneficial. It's at the age when they're starting to make friends and um, need to become a little bit more independent and things like that. You know, I, I think we do absolutely need a childcare section. I'm not a se uh, sector. I'm not arguing against that at all. But the evidence for the impact on much smaller children, so particularly naught to twos, is very unclear. Um, and certainly the evidence I've seen suggests that it's not long hours in institutional childcare are not good for not to twos and could be having a long term detrimental impact. And so therefore, I think it's very irresponsible for governments and of course, not just ours, but across the world to push uh, institutional childcare for not to two year olds as an economic solution when we're not actually clear at all about the long term impact um, on children. But of course, this debate is just so complicated because we're stuck in this idea that work is the most fulfilling thing you can do, whether you're male or female. And for some people, of course, that's true, especially people with high powered, influential, well paid jobs. It's an incredibly fulfilling and rewarding thing to do. But of course, most women don't have jobs like that. I mean, most men don't have jobs like that. If you stack shelves in Tesco, if you're a receptionist, and, you know, very important jobs, though they are, you're probably not going to think it's worth putting your child in nursery eight hours a day 
if you miss that child and you know that child misses you and it's making both of you stressed, it's probably not worth it. But, you know, those people aren't particularly well represented in Westminster and the media, so it's quite hard uh, to get that message across. But I do think that we've got a lot to learn from other countries who do have much more pro-family policies whether it's taxation or childcare or whatever. And, you know, I'd like us to move towards that space. Yeah, it's worth saying that the UK is probably worse than a lot of other countries on this. Like, for, for instance, the fact that we, the tax system penalises single earner families and we have quite uh, sharp cutoffs for when you lose child benefit and things like that. We, we could definitely be more family friendly. So a country like Germany, for instance, is, has a better tax system than we do by quite some distance. Yes, definitely. And um, the fact that we tax people individually rather than as households means that families in the UK pay around 30% more tax than families in other countries like Germany, like the States. And clearly that's really hard for families because it makes it financially difficult. But also it sends a really bad message out, which is that Parenting is not important. Family life is not important. Whereas I think that probably the best contribution you can make to society and the economy is to have children and raise them well, because they are the future of the uh, of, of the country and of our economy. And if you look what happens when it goes wrong, when children have bad childhoods and, um, you know, fail in education, uh, get into crime, you know, the cost of, to society of that is absolutely huge. So we should be saying to people, actually, children aren't a burden. Uh, They are our future and we will support you to to raise them to the best of your ability to make sure that we've got a future uh, for the country. But unfortunately, at the moment, children are often seen as an economic burden, a problem to be solved, whether that's through childcare, rather than actually a future that we need to be invested in. And that that is a whole culture-wide thing. It is better in other countries, absolutely. But other countries are suffering the same birth rate issues as we are so I although I absolutely want to see reform of our taxation system to prioritize families I don't actually think that in itself will help people to want to have children or or, or, sorry to choose to have children uh, more I think there's something much deeper going on than that Uh, by the way people absolutely do want to have children 92 percent of young women do want to it's not the desire but as we can see from the figures, it's not happening. Uh, and that's the same even in countries that have much better pro-family fo- policies than we do. Yeah, sadly. What kind of response have you had to talking about the pro natalist question? Well, um, yeah, it mixed. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think the message is, is getting through. And obviously, it's not, not just me talking about this. You've spoken about it a lot. There's a number of people who are talking about it. But certainly around a year ago, I just thought I wanted to speak about this. I expected to get a very negative reaction, but I I do think it's one of the biggest threats to our economy. And, you know, we can talk about it as a social and emotional issue, which it is. The number of women who want children who are not now having them is a massive problem for those women as individuals. But as a politician, looking at the economic consequences of declining birth rate. Um, It's terrifying. And again, it's not just happening in this country. And it struck me that in other countries, they are at least speaking about this. Nobody's got the solution. But in countries like France, you know, they are starting to talk about their birth rate problem. And we just weren't touching it in this country. And so I just I just thought, you know, it is right to raise this uh, as an economic red flag. You know, even if we don't want to get into the issues about, you know, women and fertility and all those difficult topics. Um, and actually, it's interesting to see, as I said, you know, lots of people are now speaking about this. But it is interesting to see now at least all the mainstream media are recognizing this as a problem that the low birth rate is a problem economically. We're not anywhere near talking about the solutions yet, but I think that is a good start. So yeah, I've had mixed reactions and certainly a lot of people very much don't want like me talking about it. But I do think in combination with a few others, we have shifted the debate in this country to at least to be able to talk about it as a problem, which is the first start, it's the first step. I've noticed the same sort of change in the last couple of years that it's become something that you'll regularly see in the newspapers and things like that. So it's not, um, I think a lot of people are still maybe at the point of thinking that you just need a few tweaks here and there in policy, um, that it's less of a radical issue than I think it is. But yes, I think that the, I think that there's been, the needle has moved a little bit. Yeah. The go-to solution is always, well, for the left, it's always free childcare. 
Women yeah. aren't having children because there's not enough free childcare. But you just look at somewhere like Finland, which has got free full-time childcare for every child from the age of 10 months, and they have an even lower birth rate than us. So even if it, you think it makes financial sense, it's obviously not working. It's not, it's not the answer. Well, and I think there's an obvious natural reason for that. If we go back to kind of learning from nature, people don't have children in order to then pass them off to somebody else um, to get back out to the important job of uh, growing the GDP. That's just not how people work. And I think, you know, the, the, that bond between mother and, and baby, we should not underestimate how powerful that is. And certainly for me, when I got to the six month point and all my friendship group were thinking about, do I go back to work? How much do I have to go back to work? Not one of my mum friends wanted to go back to work. Now, some people had to for financial imperative or to keep their career in a, you know, state that they could return to it, but nobody actually wanted to leave their baby. And I, we shouldn't, we, we, we constantly underestimate how powerful that, that bond is and how necessary that bond is, particularly for the baby. Yeah. I think that's understated as well as an issue. I mean, we, I had um, Eka Commissar on the podcast a little while ago and she spoke about all the evidence for daycare in particular causing stress to young babies, um, which does seem to be very uh, clear. But one of the things that much more rarely gets spoken about is just the distress that it causes to mothers. So it, and partly because it's considered to be a bit, a little bit embarrassing maybe to admit that you'd rather be home because it, the and it's not something you'd want to voice in the workplace generally because it will make you sound like you're not really committed to your job um but you know you go into mums net or any of these platforms and it's very easy to find women who are hate having to leave their babies um but feel like for various reasons they don't have a choice it feels like the feminine equivalent of telling boys that they shouldn't cry it's not manly to cry and certainly that doesn't happen so much now, but certainly, you know, was, men should grit their teeth and bear it and not show emotion and it, in order, you know, to uh, be strong um, for society. And it feels like that is what women are being told now. You know, this feeling you have, you know, just put it to the bottom. It's not important. The most important thing is that you can go out to work and be fulfilled in your career. Um, so you need to just put that feeling to one side. And yet there's a reason for that feeling. And, you know, it is causing distress. But I think sometimes those of us who talk about this are characterized as old fashioned and traditionalist and, you know, wanting to put women back in the home. But I mean, I don't think that at all. And this is this kind of 1950s ideal of, well, it's not an ideal, but this, this vision of a woman at home, you know, caring for the children and the man out in some office job. I mean, that's not representative of, of most of history. Women have always been economically active whether that's not not informal work I suppose like they are now but the idea that women just sit at home and don't do anything is ridiculous um, and being a stay-at-home mum in my mind does not mean just sitting there doing the housework there's an awful lot of things that women who don't who, who aren't doing economic work do in communities and volunteering I'm, I was a parish councillor you know on the um, and on the parent teacher association, all those kind of things that are really important and are not in the home. And most women want to balance those different things: caring for their children, doing some work, doing some volunteering. That's most women's experience. And I think it's unfair to characterise this debate as either you want all women to stay at home or you think all women should be in the workplace. I think it's much more nuanced than that. Nuanced than that, and it is about choice and everybody finding the right balance for their own family. And and remember, this is a tiny, tiny period of time. You know, three years, four years when your child is small to have to make these decisions. It's not about the whole of you know saying goodbye to the whole of the rest of your career at all. It's actually just about finding the right thing for you and particularly for your children in those first in those early years this is what i go on about with the main mother matriarch thing women's lives are more segmented by reproduction than men's yes. are and so the idea that that you can have a kind of uh classically masculine career path yes isn't very realistic and what a lot of women will do is have a, a first career or a first job yeah. and then do something a bit different or go part-time or whatever or, dro or, or drop out entirely when their children are little and then either return to the same thing or do something different and like that kind of three-part system isn't something that we talk enough about I think. Yes and the temptation is to try and use technology uh, particularly reproductive technology to try and become more like men I mean frankly that seems to be what's happening and it is, I can see why people do think it is frustrating to have these natural biological limits. And certainly it is different to what men experience. But 
you know, what choice have we got? You know, this is just nature. There's no, there's no value judgment attached to it. It's just natural, isn't it? And this is why I'm quite concerned about all the um, push to encourage women to freeze their eggs because, again, it looks, on the face of it, it looks like a sensible solution. You know, you're not ready to have children now. You haven't got a partner or you haven't got a house, whatever it is. Why don't you freeze your eggs and have children later? And firstly, this seems to be selling women a lie, quite frankly, because it doesn't actually work very well. I think only 1% of frozen eggs become babies. Even if you do thaw your eggs successfully and have them fertilized, there's only a 19% chance that, you know, the, the embryo transfer will work, you become pregnant and have a baby. I mean, it's a really, really poor insurance policy if you're thinking about it like that. But, but again, this idea of trying to persuade women that you can um, evade this natural state of affairs, this natural fertility window is not it's not helpful to encourage people to think that you can escape that reality. And I think instead of encouraging women to freeze their eggs, we should be looking at policies that allow women to have children at the time they say they want to have children, whether that is housing policy, taxation, whatever that is, um, cultural change. We should be enabling women to have what they want at the time they say they want it, rather than to be trying to persuade them to live through a male pattern uh, reproductive cycle. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. But one thing we just don't do well enough is value mothers. If society valued motherhood, if it saw it as something, a positive contribution, if it honoured mothers and what they do in terms of raising the next generation, I think we'd be in a very, very different position. Whereas at the moment, the only thing society honours is contribution to GDP. That is the only thing that really gets you status in society. Yeah, and people are basically rejo- regarded as fungible as well. That's an important element of that ideology in that, you know, a childcare worker is just the same as a mother. You know, immigrants are exactly the same as natives. Men are exactly the same yes. as women. Like, there's no, there are no differences um, between yeah, people and the relationships point. between yeah. people don't matter. On the um, IVF question, something that sometimes gets floated as a, um, as a pronatalist policy is that the government should be offering free IVF. There's some IVF already offered on the NHS, but there's a bit of a postcode lottery and so on. Um, I'm sceptical of that idea, at least doing it purely on a pronatalist basis, because I think that the risk is that a lot of people overestimate how effective IVF is, particularly for age-related infertility. My understanding is that if you're having IVF for some other infertility or subfertility problem, it's it's good. But for age-related, it isn't really. And the risk is that if people think that it's there in the future as their backup, they'll plan their lives accordingly. So I think it might actually be, yeah, I think it might be counterproductive, that one. Yes, I think it's giving people a false sense of security, uh, that they think that there's always this option. There's some polling I did last September um, was really shocking in terms of people's misconceptions of this. I mean, firstly, I think 70% of young women, so 18 to 35 year olds, thought that it was um, there was no problem with waiting until you're 35 to start thinking about trying for a baby. And obviously, sadly, that's just not true at all. Fertility drops very quickly after 35. Um, and secondly, they thought that because of advances in technology, it was possible to have a baby at any age. Now, technically, it is almost possible now to have a baby at any age and certainly there are a number of celebrities who have babies in their late 40s although it's never clear exactly how that's happened um but of course for the vast vast majority it's 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 not a reality and i mean ivf is sadly very un- low success rates over 40 very low and so yeah i am really concerned that women are being sold this insurance policy if you like that will turn out to be a complete dud and then they will have lost their chance to become a mother. And, you know, said 92% of women want children and the average number of children they want is 2.5. And yet we're now at the point where fertility rate is 1.5 and falling. That's an awful lot of women who are not achieving their dream, if you like. And that is a big deal. It's a big deal socially and emotionally as well as for the economy. And I just, and I just don't think we should be allowing women to be sold this idea that because of technology, if as long as you've got enough money, um, you can probably solve it. it. It just isn't true. So I think, you know, there's different arguments about IVF, who should fund it and what it's for, but it's certainly not an answer to the birth rate issue. It's just too expensive and too uh, ineffective. The episode is not over. There is another maybe 30 minutes of content, but it is behind a paywall. If you would like access to that content, if you would like to show support for the show, pay subscriptions 
are what keep it on the road, allow me to pay my producers, put food on the table, all that important stuff. The extended version of the podcast is available at my Substack, louiseperry.substack.com. That's where you can also find, as I say every week, bonus episodes, extended episodes, uh, the MMM chat community, all of this. Um, please sign up for a pay subscription. It makes such an enormous difference to my ability to keep producing the podcast and grow it even bigger, produce more episodes, all that good stuff. There are other ways that you can show your support for the show as well. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on YouTube. You can tell your friends and family uh, how much you like the show. If you find it valuable, all of these things make an enormous difference to our ability to keep making it. Thank you so much. <laughs>